are trying to hold investor conferences. I think it's a great sign for Indian democracy. Late last year, the Madhya Pradesh government had it. The West Bengal government had it. Uh, last Monday, I had an opportunity and privilege of attending that. And Gujarat, as usual, is having its uh, conference every two years. In fact, I have attended, as a commerce and industry minister in Mr. Vajpayee's government, the first wiper in Gujarat. This was a conference in a very modest-sized auditorium in Ahmedabad city, the town hall. And at that time, this is what we thought vibrant Gujarat uh, conference would be like. And today, it apparently has become one of the foremost uh, economic uh, conclaves as far as India is concerned. In order to attract investment, you must have stability of policy, that is what the Prime Minister said yesterday. Your direction must be clear. And the pace of moving on that direction must be reasonably quick. I had said this at the CEO's convention last evening that the biggest criticism I have seen in the last one month of our government is why have you taken decisions so quickly? You should have waited till the cows returned home till the opposition decided to allow the Rajya Sabha to function. Why are you resorting to a faster means of taking decisions? In fact, that's been a criticism. And we did take decisions the right way because that was also intended to convey a message to every Indian and to investors all over the world that even if one House of Parliament takes uh, some time to settle down and start functioning, India cannot stop functioning in the meanwhile. India must continue to grow at a pace. And I think it's about time, what we've said repeatedly, that India has to get over these traditional mindsets of projecting whether you want to be branded as pro-industry, pro-business, pro-economic activity, or just pro-poor. Distribution of poverty without growth is not a solution to India's problems. And one of the tragedies of the last one decade was we didn't encourage production, we didn't encourage growth. We just concentrated on the distribution mechanism of what we already had. And that's probably one of the reasons why we slowed down. Having said this, India unquestionably needs investment. We probably may succeed in stopping the reverse journey of investment, uh, leaving our shores and going outside, something which was happening in the last three, four years, attracting investment into the country, because there is a huge distance which we still have to travel. The tribal areas of India, the eastern states of India, the people of India living below poverty line, none of them can grow unless there is a very strong and a powerful economic activity which is pushed up as far as the country is concerned. In the last seven months, bearing this in mind, this is precisely what the government has done. We've opened up several areas of investment. Insurance was pending for a long time. In fact, one of the powerful reasons why we came out with an insurance ordinance was that how do we arouse the confidence of investors 
if India is going to take 10 years to decide what to do with its insurance policy. If a policy decision with regard to the insurance sector, you can have indecision for a period of 10 years, this is certainly not in a very exciting uh, situation as far as Indian investment scenario is concerned. We wanted to settle this debate once and forever. On the defense sector, we are amongst the largest buyers in the world. And somehow we had a mindset, even when the last government decided to raise the investment limits. Defense is a sec sensitive section. We must not allow foreign investment. And that obsolete thought prevailed in the government's decision making. You can buy 100% of your requirements from foreign governments, from companies controlled by foreign governments, from internationally private companies. But if you are going to set up a company with a 51% Indian control, with a lot of foreign technology, foreign IPR intellectual property, and a foreign equity participation, somehow the thought process in the government was decided to be stopped. Mr. Vajpayee's government had raised it to 26%. We took the first available opportunity in raising it to 49%. In sensitive cases, we've said, in selective cases, we are even willing to go beyond that. If 100 smart cities are to be created, and as against traditional cities, we've seen the facility of smart cities. Gandhi Nagar, where you are currently seated, is a smart city. The first Indian smart city to be created probably could be Chandigarh. There are now satellite cities around Chandigarh which are being created. Noida and Greater Noida on the outskirts of Delhi. New Raipur in Chhattisgarh. Now these are recent experiments we've made and good experiments we've made. And therefore, so that Foreign capital, international capital is available to them. We've opened up in that sector, we've liberalized in that sector. So even two tier and three tier cities are allowed. Investment in infrastructure in the railways has been allowed. We had a very important uh, responsibility, something which had scared investors away was a highly adversarial tax regime in India. Things may not change overnight, but the present government is determined to have a perfectly non-adversarial tax regime. And therefore, one of the first assurances of pushing that we gave to the foreign investors was that this government does believe that the retrospective taxation idea was a defining moment against investment in India. It made a material difference and this government has no intention of using that provision. For past dispute, a very few ones pending before tribunals or courts, we are waiting for the verdicts to come. Publicly, the government has taken a position that an aggressive tax regime in which investors had a lot of grievances. And when I sit with my team of civil servants preparing for the next union budget, not one of those identified cases has brought me any revenue. It's only brought a bad name to investment and a bad name to India. And therefore we are seized of the matter and putting a quietus to most of those disputes is a clear roadmap that this government has talked for itself. We are creating mechanisms inside the revenue department itself. Things like uh, advanced routing mechanism even for domestic investors. A powerful body to set up, uh, suggest uh, changes which are required in the tax administration and in the cases already is functioning. The ease of doing business. This is not merely a slogan. 
But how many steps were taken in the last 10 years which complicated the doing of business? <laughs> Company law of the corporate affairs is one of the departments I handle. <coughs> From 2008 to 2013, we spent five years bringing a new company law, completely out of tune with the requirements of the current requirements of business. In the initial few months, we were able, after consultation with the industry and the stakeholders, identify at least 50 areas where that one year law was complicating the doing of business in India. Decision making, the whole concept of corporate democracy, the rule by majority, there have been provisions where it is the veto of the minority which prevails. Now there are some provisions which can be let down by notification, some by rules, and some required to be amended. I have introduced those amendments, the Lok Sabha has already passed them, I am waiting to take them into the Rajya Sabha. The land law. And one of the lessons we have to learn is that if on election eve, just with a focus on now electoral results, some legislations or steps are brought in, it's not necessary that they'll get you votes. States like Rajasthan, states like Mag uh, Haryana came out with very populist schemes on the eve of state assembly elections, but the governments who did that lost. So it's not necessary that they bring you votes. One of the motivating factors behind uh, the provisions behind, some of the provisions behind the land law itself was even if the developmental process suffers, it may prove to be populist. It didn't prove to be populist. But areas where India needed to grow, and therefore this government being committed to that change, we have consciously brought out those changes. The areas where we've simplified the procedures, are all areas which are not going to only help investment in India, but which are also going to invest, help substantially the rural sector in India. Now, what are the exceptions we've carved out? Obviously, defense and security of India had to be an exception in national interest to the complicated procedures. Rural infrastructure. Rural electrification, rural roads. Now today, the existing law, the 2013 law, did not have a provision for it. Now who does it help? It will improve the value of land. It will be a facility to the farmer. Housing for the poor. There is an urban, rural migration into the urban areas. It's inevitably going to be happen. You need new townships, you need suburban townships. It's going to help these migrants from the rural areas. Affordable housing and housing for the poor. Industrial corridors. So wherever the industrial corridors are going to come up, it's essentially going to help the corridors running through rural areas between two major towns. You'll have a highway, you'll have a, a narrow industrial corridor on either side. And it helps villages in increasing value of land, generating employment for those villages in all these areas. Now, each one of the actions which we've carved out is friendly to rural India. And some provisions which almost uh, rendered economic activity impossible have been overturned. Any land which is not built upon in five years will have to be returned. Townships are not created in five years. 
railway lines from one major area to another don't get completed in five years. Irrigation projects, dams don't get completed in five years. So if the original legislation had stayed, it would have only rendered India into a country of incomplete projects. Five years, uh, last 15 years I've been seeing the Gandhinagar surface highway which led us to this place. So if this law had been in place, you'd probably have a, a highway at part of the places, an agricultural activity at the rest of the places. Now an impractical legislation of this kind, therefore had to have be altered. The tragedy, however, is that there are uh, people who privately welcome it to me, but say our political compulsion of our party is this, that we may have to take a contrary system. Area of uh, difficulty, the coal problem. From 2006 to 2014, and with one ordinance we've eased in data. It's been cleared by the lower house, I'm sure it'll be cleared by the upper house. Pragmatically the same situation remains. You had private parties being given coal blocks on discretionary basis. It was complained that they were being given on a corrupt criteria. The Supreme Court believed it, the CAG believed it. An arbitrary criteria a discriminatory criteria. All we've done is that the same people will now have to stand in a queue, bid for it. It's a reverse bidding so that it doesn't increase the prices. 